Hey everyone, hello from the Hoboken Historical Museum. We're streaming out live. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. YouTube is our main platform and you can sign on and text and ask a question and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Hoboken Talks is featured every Thursday night and we invite, uh, shall we say, important people from Hoboken and past shows. Actually, we've been doing this for over a year, so we have over 62 past shows. Greg Delaquilla, Stu Chicharella, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I'm blanking out, but we got, we've had so many shows, so check them out. And my name is Bob Foster, and I'm here tonight with a really special guest. His name is Peter Gutierrez. And uh, we may, uh, at the end, we'll mention some upcoming uh, uh, shows that are going to be featured. But let's welcome Peter Gutierrez. Peter, you're looking yes, good. I love that moon. I know. <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, you know, I think I saw you on Hudson Street uh, yeah. maybe a month or so ago. That's right. That's right. And yeah, I think your, your amazement, you were, well, to kind of satisfy the Sherlock Holmes investigation you were doing. <laughs> Did he move back? Is he here for real? And yeah, I gave you the confirmation. Yeah, I'm here. And you were just, there we go. You were just ecstatic. Well, you, I was ecstatic, but you seemed really ecstatic to yes. be back in Hoboken. Yes, yes. And I guess the first question I'll ask is, what is Hoboken to you? What? Why do you like Hoboken? I love Hoboken because it's family. You know, that's something that's been ingrained in me since I was very younger. I, uh, since I was very young. I mean, when I was younger, I've always remembered it as just a town where, you know, it's very simple to have conversations with your neighbors. You know, I mean, meeting you guys were something big. You know, I thought I'd had to be kind of like an older person just to walk in here and have conversations with you guys. You guys picked it up one, two, three, you know, having questions about my town and learning more, you guys kind of, satisfy that quench I had for, you know, history and, and information. And also, too, even with my friends, there was this kind of aura we had where it was like we wanted to be kind of like our parents because they've always talked about Hoboken as like almost like when someone talks about Jurassic Park or someone talks about <laughs> Star Wars, like this big movie that you had to be there when it first came out. Oh, you're never going to have the same experience I am. And I'm happy to say almost 10 years of me being consciously aware, uh, being with my friends, I think we kind of came close to what our parents were able to experience here in this town. And that's why I love it. As they say, timing is everything. Yeah, it is. It you're, is definitely. You're here at a good time. Uh, just to give a little context, I think I first met you uh, when you were 15 years old. Yes. And you're now 23. And 23. you were a very mature 15 year oh, old. Thank you. If I had to bet money on it, yeah. I would go, this guy's 18 years yeah, old. Definitely. Definitely. And you just had such a a great personality, oh, you. Um, and you were engaged to help with summer camp. That's right. And you were like, you know, we almost felt we could just leave you the keys yeah. and <laughs> the kids would be safe and sound. Yeah, and that's literally how it felt. You know, it was amazing to kind of get that responsibility, but also feel like I had that confidence in you guys to, you know, be a part of the things that we see here. You know, these are artifacts that you guys obviously take care of you prepare them well and for me to feel like i'm a part of a history channel or something it was like guys i get to touch stuff that people haven't touched in years you know you probably don't even know they exist and here i am getting that first look or you know front row seating to it and just to clarify we didn't leave you with the keys no, and the kids <laughs> uh, there was uh, an adult in charge that's right it was, but it was you very were fun. very mature and it just really felt good to have you here yeah and here you are 23 yeah back in hoboken yeah. uh and that's pretty cool yeah. and i i always felt like even when i met you just a couple of months ago you still had the same enthusiasm yeah. that like people have uh who've grew up in hoboken yeah. who are in their 
50s, 60s, 70s. You know, and uh, here you are, you know, under 30 years old, right. and you have that Hoboken spirit. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, with our friends, that was kind of, well, with my friends, that was kind of a big thing. It was like we've always seen, you know, our parents talk about kind of these legends of Hoboken, and we were like, we have to be legendary. You know, we have to be like them. We have to have those experiences. And for me, you know, talking about like when you first met me, I kind I think – I probably met you maybe when I was like a year younger. I was I remember going out to Maxwell Park over here by where the rocks are. Uh, and it was right next to the beach. And I remember me and my friend, we went out and we found this rock. It was cut in half and it looked like a gem. But we thought we discovered like gold or something. I was we looked at each other. We were like, we have to run to the museum because someone must know what this is. And I remember running over here with him. And I don't know if it was you or maybe Bill. Someone was like, uh, yeah, you know, maybe you had something, maybe you did it, but it just felt like wow. And then that was like my first real like that, that was my first boom, like wow, we have a museum here in Hoboken. Right. You know? I actually remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and but I don't remember it as you. I remember the other kid you're yeah, with. Yeah, I was kind of very and what scared. Was, do you remember who it was? Yes, Chris Alamo. He, he was definitely like my first friend. You know, he was he was my neighbor here. Uh, he was always behind the building that I lived in. So we kind of, you know, we were school buddies, too. And then for us, I was like, oh, I don't know if we're, we're allowed to go in there again. We, we <laughs> must have that. We must need this prestige to walk through those doors mm. and, and, you know, and talk to them. They want educated people, not two kids in fifth grade with a gem, you know. And I remember he came in and he was like, hey, is this worth something? And that's it. Right. You know, and I probably let you down easy. Yes, definitely. Right. Yeah. No, it was. Uh, <laughs> that was it. And I said, hey, I'll take it. And, exactly. uh, here's a dollar. <laughs> here's a dollar. Uh, right. And that was funding for the museum for there a year. You go. There you go. I think it was like a schist or a court, something yeah, that glimmered. Exactly. And uh, you guys got ahead of yourselves. Oh, a little definitely. Bit. Yeah. Sure. We thought we were, you know, people that study gems and stuff like almost like geologists. There. Right. But even then you have an interest in science yeah. that's still yeah. with you for sure. Usually I always, oh, here's Eric Kammer, a family town. Excellent. So Eric also has that same enthusiasm that that's you right. have, but he's, you know, several generations older. Yeah. So oh, it's kind of yeah. cool. Definitely. I can imagine. Oh, there goes Evie. <laughs> okay. So who's Evie? Evie's my sister. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And yeah. I think we have some pictures of Evie yes. later. Yes. So oh, there and, goes my mother. Oh, okay. I'm just so proud of Peter. Mom loves you. Yeah. And I, I've met your mom. I know your mom. Oh, yes. And, You've uh, eaten her empanadas. So oh, we know. Oh, right. <laughs> and we're so glad uh, the family is back here in Hoboken. Yeah. And not go. too far from the museum. Well, Less than a hundred feet, I want to say, maybe a little more than that. Okay, something like that. Sure, sure. And uh, usually, whoa, we got more people. Yeah, Laura and Nolasco, so proud of you. Yeah, okay, she so. was actually there for when we get into the exhibit. She was there as okay, well. Okay, cool. And then cool. also too, my uh, my cousin uh, Eric, he was there too. He said, mm -hmm. "Yeah." Um, so I always like to make a comment about the background. Yeah. So is this a Hoboken moon or what's going on with this background? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's looking out towards the New York skyline. Pretty much I just ran out and I took the telescope and I said, hell, let's see if I could take a picture of it and just shot it right on my iPhone. And yeah, I just took it out. And, you know, people, when they see a telescope like that, the first thing on their mind is like, what the heck is that guy watching? He's watching aliens or he's doing something with a telescope. And then they look at it and they're like, oh, my God, like it's the moon. You know, it's something that you see every day. But when you see it in such detail, it's just. It and is this is from your friggin iPhone. Yes, this is from my iPhone. Yes. It's amazing. This is what I'm amazing any editing. So trying yep. to trying to get there. And this I got. Go Peter, Tita, Anna here. Yes, this is so. This is my uh, this is my aunt Anna. She's awesome. She also grew up here in Hoboken, and uh, yeah, she's just she's someone else. Again, when we talk about Hoboken and we talk about family values and, and what does it mean to come from Hoboken, she's kind of those that person that I would emulate and, and strive for. Gotcha. You know, big role model. That's great. 
Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, the exhibit that you did. Yeah. Um, so we have some pictures from that exhibit. Yeah. And one of the skills that you got involved in in summer camp, like right. an activity for the kid, was making paper airplanes. That's right. Which in my day, paper airplanes would always get you into trouble because right. you flew them, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the classroom when the teacher turned their back. Right. and you know, things like that. They could actually be a little dangerous if you made the nose uh, really sharp. sharp right? And, you know, I can remember some incidents, shall yeah. we say. <laughs> but yeah. in my mind, you took paper airplanes to a new level. Oh, thank and you. we were so amazed with the depth of your, the variety and the aerodynamic qualities of yeah. these airplanes. We invited you to do an exhibit. That's and right. you are probably the only, I'll say, young adult who's ever yeah. done a solo exhibit in, yeah. in the upper gallery. And it was, you know, uh, I don't know if we'll ever do another one. Yeah. So that's oh, something you should be proud of. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Like, I remember, you know, speaking to a lot of people in school. And then again, even with employers, the first thing they're like, oh, you had an art exhibit? And I'm like, yeah, I had an art exhibit. You know, and they're like, show us pictures. Like, what do you mean you had an art exhibit and you were like almost 15 years old? And I'm like, I just made paper airplanes and someone looked at it and they were like, uh, we're putting this in an art gallery. And it was very amazing. You know, I was I love airplanes. And especially at that time, one of the biggest things that, you know, motivated me was my grandfather. And then, you know, my mother also taking us to air shows. So getting involved with that, seeing airplanes, you know, like looking at the B-24 Liberator, an American bomber used in World War II, I just kind of looked at those and I was like, I want to see if I can make them in paper form. And I loved Boeing. I still love Boeing. I love SpaceX now with space and everything. And I figured I want to see how do those guys feel when they make a model or they make a, an aircraft that, lo and behold, I make them out of paper. Right. And I mean... Again, you were really deep into the yeah. paper airplanes. Oh, definitely. That's for sure. And definitely. you could you could emulate any type of plane, it seemed like. Yeah, it was it was definitely a fun experience, you know, definitely going home and like, okay, I'm doing another paper airplane. I finished all the homework that I had. And there used to actually I went to school in Wallace, right? That was my elementary school. And there was this gym teacher that I had. I love him. His name is Mr. Salvetta. He is an awesome, awesome man. Another guy, when you talk about Hoboken and you know Mr. Salvetta, like that is the guy. And I remember he would tell me about like, you know, because I'm big into history. I love war aircraft. So we were talking about Vietnamese aircraft and uh, well, Vietnamese war aircraft. And we would talk about these different models and things like that. And I used to bring him to school and he was kind of like my Gene Kelly of Lockheed Martin, you know, he was like, you have to improve on this wing design so it can go further. And then if you do this, it's going to go farther. So he was kind of like my guy saying, hey, this airplane is going to go fast if you do this, this and that. And then that kind of opened up my curiosity into the world of aerodynamics. I have a great connection for you. Okay. Do you know the Sunoco station uh, on the Willow? Sunoco uh, across station. from Trader Joe's pretty yes. much. And uh the Walgreens, yes. the guy who runs that station, his name is Mir, okay. and he was a fighter pilot in Vietnam. Okay, there and, we go. In the Vietnamese Air Force. Oh, wow. You got to talk to him. That would definitely be. I'll a, introduce you. Yeah, that would definitely be a great conversation. That's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so we're just going through some more slides maybe from the exhibit. Yeah. And this is at the opening of the exhibit in the right. upper gallery, right. which is where we're actually broadcasting the show. So Correct. here we are, you know, 2013, exactly. 2020, 22. And who are these folks? And this is my grandfather and my grandmother. Wow. Yeah, they are very monumental into my life. So seeing them there was just an amazing experience. I mean, looking at my grandparents, what they've been through coming to this country from another country, you know, looking at it and thinking that their grandson is going to have an art gallery, you know, 
it, it ain't the it ain't the Rockefeller Center or something like that. But it's amazing <laughs> to think like, wow, you know, here is my grandson here doing something like this, and I get to be a part of it. And they've supported me throughout everything I do, and they still do. They're amazing, and I love them so much. And it's awesome to share that with them. Because that's what it was, really. It wasn't like, you know, for as much as everyone was congratulating me on my artwork, it was really an extension for them, you know, as, as showing gratitude. Like, look at what I could do. And to have you here and enjoy that with you, that just makes it everything. That makes it the MoMA. You know, that makes it sure. everything. No, um, and your expression says yeah. it all, yeah. for sure. And uh, can you talk about the country um yeah they they're so they they're both from el salvador uh salvador in central america very nice country i mean it's being cleaned up now a lot so that's really good and i do have plans to visit the country but yeah when they came here it was you know american dream let's go i got this and my grandfather has more history with hoboken than my grandmother him being the first one to come here for that side of the family and to him, you know, one of the biggest sayings that I took from the Hoboken Historical Museum when we did, when you guys did the World War I exhibit, which was heaven, hell, or Hoboken, <laughs> I wrote an immigration paper about my grandfather. And I remember putting um, Cielo, Infierno, Hoboken, which is just translating it in Spanish. And for him, he understood what that meant. It was true. You know, it was heaven, hell, or Hoboken, and he chose Hoboken. You know, so it was amazing to say, like, wow, my grandfather made that decision, you know. In a sense. Right. And like you said, that is historically an expression from World War One, exactly. but it can be adapted to other yeah. situations. Yeah. And it's obviously catchy. Yeah. And you could use it today. Exactly. On there. Um, and tell me a little bit about your grandfather's life here. Yeah. So, you know, my grandfather immigrated in the late, uh, yeah late seventies, his parents and his sisters came here 69. So late sixties, they came here first. They were the ones who were able to get him here. And then when he came here, it was the Biggie's clan, uh, Biggie's uh, restaurant. So I'm pretty sure he probably started out as a bus boy or something like that. Just taking little jobs here and there, seeing what was left of the, the remaining factories that were here at that time. I, I, you know, I remember he was telling me Hoboken looked very differently in that decade than it does now. It was not, you know, uh, too many cars trying to find parking, you know, it wasn't the lively city. It was very, it, it was, it was somewhat different. And for my grandfather, he didn't care to him. It was, I'm not in El Salvador. I'm in America. I'm going to make whatever I can of myself without anyone telling me to, I'm just going to do it on my own. And, you know, seeing what he was able to do when he talks to me about all these places that he worked at, I'm like, could you show me where these places were? And we know Big East that was on Madison, you know, that was kind of the first place he lived, which was third in Madison. And I always hear my uncle, my father, you know, my aunts, they tell me, they're like, oh my God, we remember being there. We remember visiting him. We, it was just a different experience. And to him, it was the man who left the ranch to come into the concrete jungle-ish, you know? It was totally out of his world, but he loved it. He enjoyed it, yeah. And how many children did he have? Uh, with yes. your grandmother. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Uh, with my grandmother, nine. Wow. Nine. Yes. So definitely when the 80s came in and uh, his favorite president, you know, Ronald Reagan, uh, granted everyone amnesty when he came here. From there, he allowed uh, to the, the start to the petition of his children and uh, his wife, my grandmother. So slowly but surely, everyone was getting here, all the money that he was able to get from his jobs and being self-sufficient. You know, he was able to petition them, pay for everything that they needed, and they came in one by one. Yeah. And uh, Eric is uh, asking, how did they 
Choose Hoboken. Yeah, so it was actually his sisters. They told him about a spot here in Hoboken. I believe there was a Puerto Rican family who lived in that apartment or at least owned the building on 3rd and Madison. And they kind of took him in and they were like, hey, we'll take care of you. You know, obviously you do what you got to do, but you'll sleep here. And from there, as he was exposed to Hoboken working, he just fell in love. He didn't see anything else. Hoboken was the first part where he touched, you know, coming from a different land. And he's like, this is it. This is where I'm going to call my new home. Right. Yeah. And uh, so Biggie's was run by a lot of people would never remember Biggie's last name. Yeah. Uh, um, I just happen to know it's the Yaccarino family. Okay. And they started their business with a push cart oh, uh, wow. going around town selling clams and yeah. seafood. And typical immigrant story but yeah. italian background yeah and uh he shortened his name a bit uh yaccarino could be challenging to some people right. and then they finally uh opened up that store on madison street right and uh you know it ran its course i guess you would say right. unfortunately yeah. another one of those food institutions mom and pop store yeah. and it's just hard to keep it going so yeah. unfortunately it's not here but it was uh, kind of a stepping stone for many immigrant families to yeah. kind of make their way, the people who ran it and the people who owned it. Yeah, and I think that's what, you know, again, solidifies his emotion and his love for Hoboken, the fact that, you know, yes, there were challenges here and there, but it welcomed him. And it didn't care that the arms that welcomed him were a bit abrasive. You know, he didn't care. He was able to be here, and that was good enough. Now it was for him to try and make it the best thing that he could, and that was Hoboken to him. So hearing that story and being from here, it just – sometimes it just gets you to a different place where you can't describe it in words. Heaven, hell, or Hoboken. Heaven, hell, or Hoboken. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Again, we're still in the upper gallery here. Right. Yes, family. And uh, – and the gang is here. You're like the keystone in this picture. You're like the rock. <laughs> they don't want to be around Peter. Yeah, it's and amazing. It's amazing how I, I it, it's funny because as we all grow, you could tell like who's the tallest. And like with me, I thought everyone else was gonna kind of you know keep on growing. <laughs> but yeah, there we go. Perks of being here in America and eating American food right coming up here. But yeah, is this who's the oldest, so, uh, the woman to the far left of so, the blue scarf and aunt? Or? Yeah, that is my aunt. And then uh, right next to her are her two kids on the uh, on the down part right there. Those are my two cousins. That's also her daughter with the burgundy scarf. That's her son as well. My cousins. Uh, that's my cousin German with his gray sweater. And then my uncle right there with the striped shirt. He actually went to Stevens here in Hoboken. So another reason to fall in love with Hoboken, it's the family connections that we have with this town. Nearly everyone that I look up to has a piece of Hoboken. They've lived it. They've experienced it. And they just kind of reflected that on me. And I'm just like, there we go. Um, so... You, uh, Peter, it's me, Gina Carlo. This is incredible. I'm out of words. Yeah, there we go. Okay. And again, Peter, you, you speak so well oh, you. about <laughs> your Hoboken experience. I'm still in awe. A lot of people, you know, say, yeah, I like Hoboken, you know, yeah. but they don't have the, right. the descriptive qualities <laughs> that you're wow. bringing to this conversation. So I thank you. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, people may not know what you're throwing, but of course yeah. it's a paper airplane. Yes. And there and, were nobody, there was nobody else on the other side. So we were okay. not going to aim at Sure. Exercise. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. And actually the mezzanine was great for throwing paper airplanes over the side. Right. Yeah. Remember, you know, cause it could really travel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, definitely a fun experience. Oh, this and, one's nice too. Oh yeah, these are. I'll, I used to call this Peter's posse. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about your friends on our left. Who yes. are Really, you guys were like so connected. Yeah. So that's actually Luis Hernandez and Jesse Ocasio. These guys are awesome. They're always. We were kind of like the group 
back in school. And every time I had, so we were kind of like Skunk Works, which was really awesome when it came to model airplane making. That's What's a, Skunk Works? So Skunk Works is kind of another throw at Lockheed's special division of experimental aircrafts. So do you need security clearance oh, for this? Oh, that or? one you do. Okay. Yeah. It's a really awesome story. It started out as a tent where it used to smell like skunks and they were like, Hey, there's skunks at work. Boom. Lo and behold, it became Jim Kelly's, you know, plan. Uh, but then from there that we kind of became skunk works, you know, I, I remember I would go into school and again, you would always be able to identify me because I had a model airplane in my hands, you know? So the goal of that school day was to maintain the strength and the model at all times before someone in recess snatches it, tries to fly it, and then it gets damaged. I could tell you how many different models were destroyed because people were like, oh, shiny plane, let me throw it, and it's gone. But yes, we would always sit around at kind of like a round table at lunch or maybe recess, and we're just there like, I want to make this plane farther. Boom. What do we do? And we'll just Google stuff and we're just there and we'll work on different designs here and there. And it was awesome. It's like a little think tank. You literally, know. literally, yeah. that's what it was. It was amazing. You know, um, are you still okay? Here's Michael. Yeah. And uh, hey, Peter, your uncle. That's great. Was he in the photo or is that? A different uh, no, uncle. We have there's another photo where okay. he will be in okay, yeah, another cool. family photo. And are you still yeah. in touch with your friends in this oh, photo? Yes, definitely. I actually bumped into Lewis a few days ago. Okay. And Jesse, uh, always we're always cooking together, we're always talking. It's always a family reunion with everyone. Cool. I, meet. I think I see him on the left uh yeah. once in a while. Yeah, like, does he live a, right around here? He another one lives right around the corner. Okay, yeah, we're okay. always in proximity to the museum. There's that's like so something cool. here that's attracting us. Okay, cool. And the woman on the right with that is the Dr. empanada. Right, an empanada that my mother makes. I think that's a signature thing with us because I even make empanadas for work. And as soon as I walk in, the first thing people say is, please tell me you brought empanadas or I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother kind of passed that down on to me and be like, here you go, my son. Now you must learn how to make empanadas. Uh, but yes, this is Dr. Allgaier. She's also been a very important person, you know, in my young life, even still now, you know, well, younger, you know, thank God I'm young. You're still young. <laughs> That's okay. Right. Uh, and, you know, she's kind of someone, especially in school, who has been a very monumental figure kind of just saying, Hey, you know, these guys are reading at this comprehension level. I think if you could go a lot higher just to get yourself better, give it a shot. And so she was kind of the one to always say, there's always room for improvement. Like, yes, you're good, but keep it going. So she also expanded my horizons and saying, you know, why read one thing when you could read two and exercising that at home, it made me feel a lot better thinking that I can multitask, especially when it comes into researching topics. Again, I am no means an aerodynamicist at this time, but to try and comprehend these things, someone has to inspire curiosity in you, you know, a desire to discover. And she was definitely one of those people who were always saying, listen, you know, if you want to know something, you have to want to know it. And Boom, there you go. So she's very awesome. So to have her there was really good too. I hope she's listening. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, so this was oh, this is probably summer camp, right? Or what do you think? Or no, at I, the end of the opening? No, we've... I think this is still I, this should still be the art gallery because okay. it looks like there's a little bit of snow there. Because I remember the art gallery was from December to January, I believe. You have a good memory. Yes. And <laughs> I remember these were some of the kids that would come. I, you know, there was a lot of people that were coming in. Oh, I, we probably had a school group. Yes. And you were called in to yes. um, Definitely you know, help after them. After school, I ran over right. here to try and make it. There was yeah. usually a lot of people that would come. Uh, especially people from Stevens. I remember talking to a few students, mm -hmm. you know, and we're, they would just look at these drawings and they're like, are you sure you did them or someone else did them? Like you have these things labeled to certain parts where people, <laughs> what I'm learning now, people are doing. So it was really nice to kind of get there and be like, okay, I'm going in the right direction. And how old are you? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> Ah, yes. So this is from your album. That's right. So these are my great grandparents. So finding so these are the parents of the 
of the people we saw earlier? Of my grandfather, Pedro. Wow. Yes. yes. And so they were, they came before him. Uh, so the, my aunt, well, his sisters, my grand aunts, they were the ones who were able to bring them over and seeing them here. That was also something that motivated my grandfather to come over as well. And to them, Hoboken was it too. So I'm just want to get it straight. So these are your great, great, no, they're no, just one. You're your yeah. great grandparents. That's <laughs> correct, right. Correct. But you knew them. I did. Or... I got a chance to know my great grandmother. My great grandfather uh, unfortunately passed away uh, a few months before I was born. Okay. My older brother Julio was able to get uh, some experience with him, but I, I only have memories with my great grandmother. Okay. Yes. But they both immigrated here? Yes, they okay. came here from El Salvador, correct, yeah. And they came after your grandfather? They came before. Before? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And what do you know about them? I I know a little bit. You know, I I mean, at that time, I was probably maybe five when she passed. Uh, no, I, I was probably maybe like 10 at the time that she passed away. So I didn't really have too much of a conversation with her about sure. Hoboken. Uh, usually with everybody else, it was kind of, you know, the story of, everyone took their jobs that that were here that were available they you know these they, these guys are from a generation where you keep on working to the day you die you know these sure. are these are a group of people where back in their home country you know what you did was you were you were taken care of by your own harvest if, if there's a way of saying that you know you did what you did to survive and also too you know you ate from what you grew you live from what you built so that's kind of what they did here in Hoboken, and then they passed that on. So the they would have come here in the 1950s, or what? no? They were they were here in the late 60s. With, okay. With my yeah, like my aunt, my grand aunts. I'm just so used to saying them, my aunts, you know, because <laughs> like for them it's like extended family, so everybody's an aunt and uncle. Everything. So it's, it's just amazing to have that. Uh, but yeah, still the information with them, it's it's here and there. It depends who you ask. Those that actually had the connection with them would tell me more. Uh, but unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to talk to them full out about Hoboken. But I put them in here as a part of an image I wanted to share because just like my grandfather, my great grandfather to my parents and everyone that knew him was just a monumental person. He was awesome. And, you know, it, it's funny to see how the resemblance it, the resemblance is between my grandfather and him, they kind of do this thing where we'll dance and he'll hum a song. And everyone was like, that's how you could tell the Gutierrez is, you know, by their smile and everything. So to have that part of the Hoboken story, it's like- there And you the go. hat, and the and hat. And the hat, of course, yes. <laughs> that was the hat. Like if you are coming from El Salvador and you are here, you love Hoboken, and you want to look like a gentleman, you got to get that hat. Yeah, I hat, still have to get hat that hat. Hat and a tie. Hat there and a go. tie. That's it. Yeah. That's so cool. Okay. And there we so go. this is a newer generation. Yes. Uh, yes. So we're talking family still. Who's, who's here? So right here in the white, I have my mother. So from, the le from my left to the right, I have my mother here. Uh, in the center is Evie, my sister. She just graduated from Hoboken High School in this image. Uh, she started her college career at Stevens. And then that is my grandmother, who's also been here with my grandfather from my mother's side. They came in the 80s. So she actually has some really cool stories about Hoboken as well. Sure. Growing up here, well, uh, in her adult age, you know, right. you know, being here a part of the community. And where are we? Are we in Columbus Park? This is Columbus Park, right. right. Yep, right after JFK Stadium. They allow everyone to walk up to the park, and that's where you go to take your pictures. Everyone yeah. goes to meet up. Sure. Yeah. I've been hanging out in Columbus Park a little bit, like oh, an yeah. evening walk, and the light is so beautiful. Yes. And we were just, nice. uh, Holly and I were saying, like, hey, I don't think there's light like this in any <laughs> other park. So I yeah. took a stab. The buildings in the back – could be a few places, but exactly. it does look Columbus-y. Yeah. Um, and what's, your, what's Evie up to these days? Uh, Evie's enjoying Steven. She's, uh, you know, it's something like from my uncle, from like the pictures before, you know, my uncle, again, he being that he graduated from Stevens, 
and always going to Stevens, they kind of left an impression on us to say, hey, you know, going into higher education, that's important. Being knowledgeable in what you want to do is even better. So go out there and do it. And that obviously left a large impression on my sister because after she graduated, I remember that feeling, you know, she was like, oh, my God, I'm going to Stevens. And that was something very emotional and just very congratulatory. You know, it's something that it's just like, wow, you know, again, we can continue the Hoboken story. It doesn't end with a person. And that's what makes it beautiful is the fact that what's so good of a story if it dies off in one line? What if it can continue on, continue on? Nothing fast and furious like, but, you know, something where it keeps on going and it lives for a good reason. And for something like my sister going on there, always on the campus, it's just that extension of, wow, the story continues on. And uh, I'm getting weepy. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, and she's probably been going to school during this period. Correct. So she's yeah, had she a tough. Just, yeah, she just finished the semester. I, I remember, you know, coming back from work and then she'll be coming out of school or finishing up class. And the first thing she'll tell me is like, oh, this professor, wow, you know, and this is what we're doing now. And it's like, hey, you know what? That's the challenge. And that's what makes it awesome. Now it's time for you to get through it. And, you know, for her, she's just motivated by all that. And again, to see our uncle, you know, is always there for us it made it more inspirational and just keeping it going with our heads out high. You know, it's something amazing. Cool. Yeah. Um, but also she's going to school during this, you know, she's probably yeah, going she, to school during yeah, right the lockdown now. and yeah, Zooming. So, and Well, now she's she loves it because she's on campus and she's with the professors there and the students. So that that's really awesome with her, you know, because that's something that, again, it's the, the personal element. You know, it's one thing to have the education. It's another thing to have being communicative with the people there. You know, there's only so much a lesson can go through without having the professor touch. And she's enjoying every minute of it. She's there. She was there earlier. Oh, this Here's is. Yes. So this is my uncle Wilfredo. Uh, his mother was actually the one. So my tia Marina, who's my grand aunt, she was the ones that came here first. And so they were actually here roughly around the same time uh, for when my grandmother came and everybody else. And they also had their experiences with Hoboken High School. So it was amazing. Again, like I thought I was the only Gutierrez going into Hoboken High School because at that time there were two. My mother went to Demaris along with my uncle. And I didn't know Demaris was a high school. So to hear that I also have other Gutierrez's who went into Hoboken High, it was like, wow. You know, like, I'm not the only one. Like, I have history, you know, here in this town. So, yes. We could have done a family tree here. Yeah, literally. Literally. <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, okay. Yes. And these would be the grandparents? These are the we... grandparents, yeah. Right. In a nice isolated picture. And, right. And, uh, yeah, you know, these guys, you'll, if, if you know me very well, and anyone can kind of tell you, the most effective people, you know, those that left the largest impression on me, especially of my personality, have been my grandparents. So when I always get the critique of, hey, Peter, you know, you're just an old soul, that came from these guys. The love of music, the love of speaking the language, the culture, always cooking with my grandmother, you know, it was something to see and something to feel and for my grandmother who obviously has her struggles when she came here along with my grandfather to see how formidable of a woman she is it just kind of left that like hey man you know these these are people that you have now you treasure these people cherish them and when it's time those are the good happy memories that you live more than a lifetime on so that's something that they are to me and you know the, the first thing they'll tell you is when we go for walks around hoboken 
the first thing they'll tell you is like, oh, you know, my grandfather's funny. He'll be like, oh, this is where I took your grandmother. We came for a walk or we had a picnic here. You know, there we go. <laughs> there goes my friend Adrian. Yeah, Cielo Infierno Hoboken. There you go. I'm pretty sure a lot of people are going to get that tattooed now. So, uh, okay. okay. <laughs> you know, I think I think we're going to get some. We, we should get some commission off that. Let, but, we're going to do a banner outside the walkway go. with that go. on it. There we have different go. slogans from Hoboken. I go. never thought about it in Spanish, but yeah. we got to do it. I'm telling you, and that's something that you tell it to my grandfather, that's it. That man will wear that as a patch of honor because to him, that's what it is. That's his purple heart. That's his, that's his shield that he would go out into battle with and he'll tell everybody and he'll let you know hey you know wow uh here's eric uh can you speak a little on how your grandfather adjusted to the hoboken way of life right <laughs> the american way of life hoboken uh yeah you know obviously for someone coming from a different country the language barrier is the first obstacle you try and get over or at least very well evade, you know, if you can't really pick up the language that well, pick up certain things that you could kind of get. And that's kind of the beauty about the Spanish language, uh, just like Italians, just like Greeks, a lot of speaking is through hand gestures and through looks of the face. So, you know, getting there is awesome. But yeah, he would tell me all the time. I remember writing, uh, again, writing my immigration paper and this was kind of how I sat down my grandfather to get more information out of him, which was, how was it when you came here? How was that experience? And coming into a town at that time where it was heavily Italian, Irish, you know, if there were any Spanish people, it would be Puerto Rican, maybe a little Cuban, but heavily Puerto Rican, you know, so people already have a certain stigma on you for how you are supposed to be and how you're supposed to be seen. And he told me that he befriended a lot of people. You know, there were a lot of people who would make jokes and obviously a lot of people who would think his capacity was lesser because of what he brought to the table. But when they saw that man work like the bulls that he used to have back in El Salvador, they thought different. They were like, hey, man, that doesn't take an English language, an Italian language you know, hard work is hard work. And someone who can get through that, facing all that and still wake up with a smile and say, hey, I'm doing this for my family. It's just something where you're just like, how, how are you going to get upset over that? So he, he, he got into it very awesome. And, you know, he's very thankful for the family that was here that allowed him to assimilate a lot that made the assimilation process easy, you know, or at least took away a lot of the hard stuff, you know, for him, he, the idea of owning a home, the idea of having his family alrededor, meaning like uh, to, to his side is something spectacular. And again, a big thing that these guys taught me is the value in family. And again, that's the whole point of this talk, which is what is Hoboken to me? And I mean, I see your eyes getting watery. I don't know if anybody's, <laughs> I don't know if anybody can see that. But, you know, for me to have that effect from them. It's your eyes are watery I know. too. Yes. <laughs> it's just something spectacular. Again, that, that's my favorite word. Spectacular, phenomenal, tremendous. That's them. Right. You know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Humanity has been. You got me. You got me. You, I'm just going to say, I could look at that picture of your grandparents yeah. every day. Yeah. I think I'd love them copy of that print yep, you got it's it. beautiful Definitely. it is so Shot beautiful on iPhone, by the way let's see if yeah Apple, they're crazy <laughs> let's see if they're Apple crazy with, uh, uh, your with grandmother's dress with that yeah. crap <laughs> yeah. i mean i just wow it's something yeah it's very cool very cool whoa yes so I hope that staircase can hold all those people. <laughs> Who's the carpenter? Oh, right. Yeah, there we go. So um, we're not going to do left to right. No. <laughs> what, what's, the, what's the occasion? Okay, the whole day. So yeah. this is the 4th of July at, in Union City, actually. We are, we're facing out, and it's a beautiful view of Hoboken. <laughs> and, you know, when you, when you look down, it's very beautiful. You get to see the viaduct and everything. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. For my family. This is not everyone. 
you know, and it's funny because I have to, yes, I have to show, <laughs> yeah, I have to show yeah. dozens of pictures for people to kind of grasp the enormity of what is my family here in the U S and that's just in New Jersey, you know, not to talk about everybody else, but this is the 4th of July celebration. And I figured what the heck let's start taking pictures to kind of just see where is everyone. And to see a group of people like that, you know, again, all together united is something amazing. Right. You don't have to buy holiday presents. For no. Everyone, oh, you? yes. No, <laughs> I, think, I think a hug and a kiss on the cheek okay. is suffice. <laughs> I agree. I <laughs> or, agree. You know what it is with us? If you're cooking and you're cooking good, that's good enough. Okay. So that's what it is. So as you can tell, we are some very plumped Americans. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we eat good. So I get this feeling of assimilation, but food, was that brought over from El Salvador, different foods? Oh, yeah. Like just, just the techniques. I mean, the just the other day on the 4th of July, we instead of we did the hamburgers, hot dogs, but we did pupusas and i don't know if you're familiar with i know pupusas. i know what it is but i don't i mean i've heard the tame the, <laughs> the name but yeah. i don't really well, know what it is let me tell you something after you eat some you're uh you're just gonna want to continue finding the pupuserias around here but the pupusas are amazing they're quintessential for spanish i mean for for el salvadorian cuisine it's literally the same technique you would use in making tortillas and what you do is you fill them in and then you put them into like a disc and then you put them on a griddle and they're like stuffed pancakes almost, but they're made out of corn, well, corn meal. And uh, we call it masa because there's another process after the corn meal that goes into this whole uh, cooking. From there, you, you use your hands and you go like this, like just kind of getting the technique down took me about a good two, three years with my grandmother and all of my aunts around me uh, a lot of family conversations about you know clothing and about decisions all at that table while we're making all these pupusas have taught me very well and we were just throwing them on the throwing them on the griddle and yeah that's what that's a lot of the things that we got from El Salvador pupusas tamales which are terrific uh, there are these sweet things uh, made out of yuca. Yuca is kind of like a potato, I want to say. It's, it, to me, it tastes like a potato, but it's a different kind of root vegetable. And when you, it's called nuegados. And these things are like, they're sweet. Yeah, there's, there you go. There's <laughs> That's David. my cousin. Yeah, so he fell in love with how my aunt makes tortillas. Like that man could eat probably a huge stack of tortillas in one sitting and still say, is there more? And I remember we made him two tortillas. I remember flipping a few of them. And it's just something that, again, you know, you look at the type of people that are there, the type of family structures Italians have, tortellini, pasta, passing that down, you know, so the same thing with us. Once you get that into a recipe or a formula that you can teach your family, then there you go. Oh, there we go. Oh, yes. Uh, so I don't know if anybody can they see that too? Yeah, Maybe yeah. You can read it. Yeah. Though. Okay. So Mama Carlota, this is a pollo guisado. So pollo guisado is like chicken cooked in a tomato sauce. And this is something that I'm telling you. You put this in a pot and you have that over white rice or anything you're eating. I don't care how angry you are, how sad you are. This is the <laughs> thing that after you got a nice, uh, you know, tap on the butt for doing something bad, this will make you stop crying right away and saying, I love you. You know, it's just one of those dishes that you're just like, uh, you know, that's it. This is it. I'm done with life. This is it. This is the best thing I've right. had. The last meal. This oh, gee, if Jesus had it, let me tell you, he uh I, I think he would postpone his plans for just a little bit more. Okay. Be like, Leonardo, get this in the image. Last supper. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I I'm you're sort of inspiring me on food. I wonder if we yeah. could do a Gutierrez uh family reunion and yeah. a cooking class oh, outside and oh. just set up the tables and <laughs> Tell Whatever. my aunts, and they'll be here faster than you can say pupusas. Just 
Oops. Okay. Who knows? Who knows? There you go. Cool. Um, okay. So we're not in Hoboken anymore. Where no, are we? No. What's this about? We are in Massachusetts. So the tallest one, the tallest person you could see there all the way in the back is my awesome cousin, Christian. And he lives up in Massachusetts. And he invited us when he worked for Ocean Spray to kind of have this beautiful experience of being in these reserves for uh, cranberries. So I don't know if you've ever watched a commercial where it's like these two guys talking about Ocean Spray cranberry juice. And I would always watch that commercial. I never think I'd be there. And this is like what it looks like. I felt like the guy. I'm over here doing advertisements for cranberry juice. And, you know, they tell you have fun in there. I probably, I, I think amongst all of us, we probably ate half of those things. They were just awesome. And, uh, yeah, it was really cool. Another event that got the whole family together. And this is something, again, that my grandparents have showed me. Like I stated before, the value of family. This is something where, you know, it could be anything in the world. As long as you have us all together, that's it, man. It doesn't care if we're shoveling, you know, making stuff. As long as we're all there together and we're united, that's it. And there we go. That's that's a little, again, tip of the iceberg of the big family. That right. We have. A good uh, picture to go with everyone on the back porch. Yes. And then. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and this is the iconic image. I think this is my best image. I think that's my good side right there. Okay. <laughs> but yes, this uh, this is an awesome image. This is of me, Evie, and my little cousin, Sadie. Wow. And, uh, oh, man, that was just, again, a tremendous experience, having everybody together and just being a part of that, you know. It's, it's so what's, awesome. what's the difference in ages between you and Evie? Uh, between me and Evie, I want to say almost four and a half years, right. something like that. Yeah, apparently, you know, after every soccer World Cup, I think my parents were like, this is a good time. <laughs> you know, have Score! another one. No, exactly, right. exactly. Anyway, you know, uh, right. I think that's what it was. But yes, we, we I think that was just the, the way of doing it, you know, between my, my older brother and me, it's like four years. So I guess it's like, hey, guys, that time is approaching. Let's give it a shot. Okay. So, you know, I'm waiting for your mom to respond. Right, exactly. Um, oh, so, like but I, it re I sort of forgot, but I didn't get to know Evie as well. But she also helped out at camp, right? She Maybe did. not the first or second year. but Right. Towards, she did towards the last year that right. I was here. She did help out. And right. that was a good experience for her, too because she'd always watch what I was doing. And she was like, I want to give it a shot. You know, I want to go out there. I want to do something. Right. I want to feel like I'm giving back. And I said, okay, let's do that. You know, museums always looking for help and let's see what we can do. And she loved it. You know, right. to her again, uh, she had a great time and she was just talking about how she felt kind of getting the museum material in terms of the education that we have through the exhibits and sharing that with the younger kids. Right. And it just lit a spark in her where she's like, whatever I do in the future, no matter the, pers uh, the profession, yes, that she'll totally <laughs> well, do it again. Well, <laughs> uh, Monday, we want to see you here, Evie. Yeah, there no. you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, that's something where it wants to be involved with. Right. Know, and she worked education. with probably more Maria. Yes, uh, Maria Lara, yes. who was oh, awesome. There goes my mother, LOL. Okay. There we go. <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, let's anyway. see. Okay. And uh, so, uh, oh, so we started with the moonshot. That's our background. That's right. And, uh, you know, you, you, you went from uh, paper airplanes yeah. to... To space. To, to space. Yeah. Right. It was, it's something really awesome, you know. I remember taking an intro to astronomy course, uh, starting off my college career and kind of getting there into space. I have my one uncle, Luis, who this man, you can tell him any fact about space and he'll look at you and you are Neil deGrasse Tyson to him. You are Carl Sagan. You are like, he's just, he'll immerse himself in that. And he would always have fun with every interesting fact I'd bring him about space and to him, it's it's uh, in Spanish, it's a maravilla. It's it's marvelous, 
you know, it's something spectacular again. I wonder if people are keeping count of how many times they use that word. <laughs> but using this telescope is something that was able to bridge space to just any Google photo you find of NASA's, you know, findings. And for me, this was a really cool hobby. It's still a really awesome hobby that I'm getting into slowly. And it has given me beautiful views of the moon. Yes. Looks like Boulevard East. This is, yep, this is Boulevard East up by uh, Weehawken, right. the Union City Weehawken. And really amazing. Again, I mean, nothing beats the New York skyline, but it is not astronomy friendly. If you're trying to look at anything else but the moon, you know, that's the, that's the one kicker about astronomy. It's the brighter you are, the good chance you're going to get a picture of it, but the dimmer you are, good luck. That's when you're going to need NASA to get you those beautiful high resolution images. Right. Yeah. This is here in Hoboken. Right. This Maxwell place. Uh... Correct. Yeah. This park has always been in everything I do. I, I, this is kind of like the park that I always go back to. And I mean, it's close, but it's right there. And, you know, and here I was aiming up to look at the moon and again, for me, it's something of, with my studies, it's something of you're looking at an object that is not yours only. It's not of this generation. It's not of the past generations, but it's been here for as long as the Earth has. And to see people that you read up on, like Galileo Galilei, Nicholas Copernicus, Isaac Newton, to see these celestial bodies and look at them with the instruments that they would have killed to have you know and here you are at your disposal literally at your fingertips and at your eyelids you have a telescope that again brings you to this two hundred and forty thousand mile away object and it makes it almost two feet away and you can observe it and see the craters and see the history in the geology of the moon itself Here's Eric. What's the best planet to see with the telescope? Uh, the best planet you could see with the telescope depends on how close we are to those other planets. So Venus and Mars tend to be our neighborhood planets, but even them, they could range in the, you know, like Mars right now is probably like 120 to 130 million miles away. And the fact that you can bring that a lot closer with a telescope is amazing. Uh, every two years, there's actually a period where Mars, for about a good three, four months, is actually close to us. Those are the best times for observing planets, usually when they're close to us. We could thank Johannes Kepler of uh, the 1600s who did the mathematics, who was able to plant and say, hey, we move in an elliptical orbit. So when these planets do come around, that's the best time to see them. Yes. And your sister is oh, asking. my favorite scientist? And, and why? why? This is like a quiz show. Right, it is, definitely. And my favorite scientist has to be Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan was, you know, when it came to his idea of making everything common knowledge, or at least everyone having access to the knowledge that he has. I know he was a big proponent uh pbs you know public broadcasting and literally just sharing all that information because to him he acknowledged just like me who came into this astronomy field i was inspired by someone and i may not tell you how the universe ends or something like that but who knows i could inspire someone else who would do the mathematics who would do the discoveries whether him or her would go out there and say boom this is it so Carl Sagan is, you know, he's my, he's my Elvis Presley when it comes to, <laughs> you know, he's my Elvis Presley when it comes to astronomy. He is the guy, you know, and I think everyone could say that, you know, you look at shows like um, The Big Bang Theory, you look at big guys like Lawrence Krauss, Stephen Hawking, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and they'll tell you Carl Sagan was just a different man. And that's what made it beautiful about him. He was so simple in what he did because you could tell the passion. And again, that's one of my big things, always circling back. What makes Hoboken so special? It's the beauty is in its simplicity. 
it's not, you know, though we have the skyline of New York and we see these huge monolithic, you know, towers there. And Hoboken has the new skyscrapers that we have over at Stevens, you know, but it's the mom and pop shops here. It's the experience people have. It's Tony's hot dogs. It's Fury's and Vito's mozzarella. You know, it's torn to Sicilian slices. It's the Hoboken Historical Museum sharing that information with everyone. That's what makes Hoboken Hoboken. And again, going back to that, that's what it is. So we just went from who's your favorite scientist <laughs> yes. to the best store on Washington Street. Yep, what a great little circular thought pattern. Um, <laughs> Michael go. M. Okay. There we go. Okay. You got it, Theo. Okay. Uh, well, okay. we'll definitely have that discussion not on a live. So this okay. way there's no transcript. Good. So we're, we're kind of winding down. We're yes. going into a lunar eclipse. No, I'm not sure if we are, but <laughs> no. we, we got some of these beautiful shots that you have. Yes, thank you for sharing and, them. And uh, all shot through your iPhone? Yes, yeah, so this and is actually through my telescope. Sorry to cut you off. Um, but this is something, again, for those out there who have a telescope or kind of have some physics background, you could see a blue and a yellow line. Now, right. For some people, it's like, hey, I don't see that on the moon when I look at it by myself with my naked eye. Why is it that your telescope has this? Well, it turns out that my telescope uses lenses to bend light to bring it to bring an image closer. So in that process, certain frequencies of that visible light spectra slow down to the point that they don't catch up with the other lights in that same spectra. So we get a beautiful image, but the blue and the yellow tend to slow down. that's kind of like their speed bump so they arrive late to the party and now they're embarrassed in front of everyone so now we get to say hey blue and yellow you're not you didn't show up on time so now you get to be a part of the picture like as you are you don't get to blend into the image yes but it still makes it pretty interesting oh of course yes yeah. <laughs> yeah this is another one taking uh, uh monochromatic so just putting in a black and white on there so that this way you can't see that distortion or right. is what we would say chromatic aberration. Mm -hmm. So again, this is uh, the beautiful image of the moon. And obviously when you have your telescope, that's kind of the first thing you aim at to kind of become that explorer. You know, there you are, there goes the moon. And something that has stood with me a lot was you think of someone like Galileo Galilei ahead of his time and to him he thought those gray those like very dark gray patches on the moon were actually seas he thought that they were oceans and that's why when we look at nasa and they say we are on the sea of tranquility it wasn't because they looked at a sea and said hey i think it's a sea of tranquility when galileo planned out these images that he drew by hand mind you this was an iphone that did all this for me imagine you staring through a place of glass trying to draw these things as best as you can in the 1600s and then labeling them and then for nasa later on a few centuries later to use them as kind of the map of the moon it's amazing and every time i look at these images and i look at my telescope again it's wow, I'm seeing something that someone a few centuries ago noted down and made it popular, made it popular demand and made it popular knowledge. Like this is something that will always be with you. And it's, it's definitely something, uh, I wouldn't want to say it's religious, but it has that value. It has that sentiment, you know, it's there. And another moonshot, but yes. with a color hue. Yes. So this one was actually very cool. And it was actually brought to my attention by a passerby. Someone was walking by and they were like, hey, the moon is red. And someone was like, oh, it's because the California forest fires. And then I sat there and I said, well, could it be? And this is my thing. Anybody who knows me, if you say something like that, you can bet your bottom dollar I'm going to sit there and come up with a scientific response. And so, you know, at this time, California, most of their forests were in flames. And it turns out that these, the smoke would actually rise a few miles up into the air. 
Now, thanks uh, being that the Earth is not flat, it is round, <laughs> due to the Coriolis effect, we have the winds that could take all this smog through the periods, uh, through the days, throughout that period of forest fires that made its way towards New York. So there was some smog here. And due to chromatic aberration, just as lenses are distorted because of the friction caused by the glass itself, our atmosphere kind of acts as a lens. And the thicker the atmosphere, the more particles that are in the way as light tries to make its way through, there are certain frequencies of light that show up late to the party. And it turns out red was the one that decided to show up late to this party. So now the moon is tainted red. And again, you wouldn't get that if you didn't know some of the things, but it just, it amazes you to think that you've captured it. And when you explain it, it just makes a whole lot of sense. And to see it like that, it's like, wow, you know, something that small, you know, just like smoke in your perfume is what allowed this to change colors. The moon didn't change colors. It just so happened the environment that you were in caused it to appear in a different way. You've explained it well. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I was not a good science student, oh, but no. I, I feel like I'm sitting next to my professor. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of the best moonshot I think I have. This is this is so good that I've made it my profile picture, I think, in everything that I'm in, because it is what it is. Uh, this is obviously a dramatic, um, when I went on to the editing feature of my phone, I was able to kind of sharpen the uh, the definition of the features, but also too, I wanted to remove as much color as I could to reveal these kind of like, I don't know, to me, they're almost like a purplish kind of like shaded areas. And again, when you look at the moon and you see what the moon is made out of, the moon is made out of the same properties, metallic, you know, ge geological, that is the earth. So what you're looking at is a bleached moon because it's exposed to the sun's radiation because there's no protective atmosphere. But as it's being bleached, there are minerals that start to show up. And those, if you have a really good camera and you sit there for a while, you can actually identify the different chemicals at play, such as magnesium, silicon, oxygen, that is trapped there. Again, coming to understand that you are yourself a part of this universe. The fact that that moon shares the same thing that you just happen to live on is another connection that you have with the universe entirely. And this is just something, uh, again, it gets you to a place where you're just like, wow, how could it be? And here I am looking at it. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. So I do have to ask, yeah. um, but maybe a short answer. Yeah, is, definitely. Is there life on the moon? And when they say life, what right. could that mean? Right. So when we, so this is, there's actually something cool right now with the Artemis program, which is sending the first female astronaut by NASA uh, to the moon. That's kind of something that we're doing now within a few years. And one of the goals is survivor on uh, surviving on the moon. Because the moon lacks an atmosphere, it's bleached with solar radiation. Unfortunately, bacteria do not live on the moon. Life is not habitable on the moon. But our life is not habitable on the moon. If you understand kind of how life works and how living organisms work, some different type of organism may be able to live there, but just not life as we know it. So NASA is going there with the intent of making sure that life as we know it can live on the moon so that this way we can establish a lunar base and then boom, go to Mars and explore the beyond. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And? And I think this is, yeah, I think the this, last of the- This is the, the, moon the last moon shot and yeah. our last shot of the program. Yeah. And- uh, have you ever seen like really old silent films, like a trip to the moon? Yes, it, yes, yeah. I've seen that. Uh, that was really spectacular, trying to think that people thought that the moon, again, was another world where it had its own vegetation, it had its own wildlife. And again, it gave you that 
Columbus with the with the three ships and you were out there and you were voyaging onto the new world. Right. It's just there we go. So when you're out there on the pier at Maxwell Place and you're set up with your telescope and which is kind of a individual experience. Yeah. But does someone ever come up and say, hey, could I take a look? Oh, or definitely. We always I always get a lot of people who come over and the first thing they want to do, well, the first thing they'd say is, May I? And I go, Of course. This is I mean, what what's the beauty of knowing something if only you know it? You know, it it doesn't do anything with you because it dies with you. So when they see it again, it's I remember this one lady, she came over. And she was kind of hesitant at first. She was like, I don't know if I should ask him. Maybe he's doing something. I don't want to disturb him. She comes over and she starts tearing. And Evie was there with me. And Evie goes, why are you, why are you tearing? Why are you crying? And she goes, I've been seeing this ever since I was a little girl. And I've never seen it through a telescope. And to see it with that much clarity and to see it for what it is, it is a somehow this religious experience, this beautiful, breathtaking. At that point, it's as if it looked at her and said, hey, as much as you are the universe, the universe is also you. And boom, it just clicked in her and it's just something universal. And I think when everyone, you know, whether it's my uncle, my grandparents, my grandfather have seen the moon through the telescope. And again, to him, it's like this is an object that I've been seeing since I was younger. And for him to see it when he was at his lowest points and also at his highest points and to see how there's always that one thing that keeps coming back, something that just lets him know like, hey, whatever it is, you can still get through it. You can keep on going and it's going to inspire people. And to him, you know, everyone has their takeaway, but to him, it's just something beautiful. And for me, it's just more motivation. It's more fuel to the fire to keep on going. And I love this route, and this is the route I'm sticking with. And astronomy, there we go. Woo! Uh, Eric Hammer, thank you for the pictures and the family history of Hoboken. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for listening. Um, so, Peter, uh, this has been pretty amazing. Uh, it was... I mean, I knew we'd have a good conversation, but yeah. this was a great conversation. <laughs> and yeah. to feel your passion about Hoboken kind of inspires me. Yeah. I worry about Hoboken sometimes. Like, will new generations feel the passion that a lot of us felt right. when we first moved here? And you got it. <laughs> yeah. And again, I'm so thankful for that, you know, having that opportunity to have the people that I love the most have such a great experience with the town and that is what's just going to solidify that in me which is again if it becomes anything it's heaven hell or hoboken that's always will it will or be. in spanish or yes cielo infierno or hoboken it's it's always that so that's what it is <laughs> okay family cookout next yeah, all right exactly. even <laughs> yeah there we go She's yeah fourth right of july there. Every day, yeah, you know, here, whatever, exactly. here, here. <laughs> here. Anyway, wow, can't wait for that event. Um, so we are going to conclude. Um, I should uh, mention that upcoming uh, shows will include interviews with April Harris. I'll be talking to April. And after that, it'll be Michael Turner. And Michael will be interviewed by Stu Chicharella. I would say we're going to have two Hoboken whisperers for that. Right. I don't know if people <laughs> know that term, but it's uh, you'll learn about Hoboken whispers from Stu and Michael. And uh, we do want to thank some of the people who make this show possible, who help uh, fund the museum. And Mel Kernan, a longtime Hobokenite past, uh, not that long ago and did put us in his estate planning. And we're very thankful for his gift. Uh, uh, the New Jersey Historical Commission, which is probably our main funder, a great state agency who we thank every day for different uh, forms of support. Uh, along with them uh, is the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, which has recently given us an action grant for our next exhibit, which will be up in January. Uh, more about that another time. And then 
Uh, we have a group we call the Shipyard Circle who give it a high donor level. Great folks who love the museum and we love them. Uh, and then applied companies who are our major donors uh, have granted us the space that we call the Hoboken Historical Museum associated with the Barry family. And we thank them every day also. And uh, do want to mention that our current exhibit, The Avenue, a uh, history of Washington Street is still on view. It'll be up until the end of the year. We're still getting lots of great visitation from this exhibit, and we'd love to see you here in the museum. Uh, and uh, we should mention that uh, we'll be doing an interview tomorrow night with the photographer Carol Halabian, and uh, she photographed in Hoboken in <clears throat> excuse me in the 1970s and 80s, and we have a great group of images from Carol and we'll be talking to her tomorrow night live, just like we are speaking to you now. So please tune in for that. And then uh, we would like you to uh, you know, share, let people know about this great program with Peter. I'm so glad we're archiving it. It's gonna be fun to watch this program in 20 years and see what Peter's up to. Uh, Christian just got in there at the last moment. <laughs> Great go. job, Thanks, Peter. Uh, Joshua also not being Thank shy. <laughs> yes, he did. I can't keep up here. Peter oh, is a modern so day much. Renaissance man. Oh. Love it. I I agree. And so how many Thank Gutierrez's you. are going to sign on oh, here? Let's see. No, a, we love it. We love it. And uh, <laughs> yes. can't wait for the food event in the walkway. Right. So anyway, please let people know. Sign up and subscribe to YouTube. Uh, the more users we get, the more promotion we get, and we spread the word. And uh, what a great little program here tonight. Not so little, just great. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Rand Hoppe, for being our engineer and seeing us through this. And it's all good at the Hoboken Historical Museum. Thank you very much.